On that note, let's bring in Mr. Tim Anderson. He's the director with the Center for Counter-Hegemonic Studies, who comes to you via Skype out of Sydney, Australia. Tim Anderson, it's good to see you and have you with us on the show once again. Um, tell me what you think uh, about this recent statement by the Syrian Foreign Ministry. Well, of course, it's true that the U.S. is the lead purveyor of wars around the world and interventions um, using its 800 military bases, which have been established for a very long time. The U.S. Is, has serious internal conflict. It's one of the only Western countries which doesn't guarantee health care to its citizens. So its own internal democracy is seriously, seriously corrupted and uh, in doubt. And the lack of faith in the government there is notorious, really. It's been measured at uh, far less than the that of the states that it uh, purports to attack. The, the, um, the sad reality is that human rights, which is a very popular concept in this century, in the last two decades, has been weaponized. It's become a weapon of war. It's been used for particularly the liberal imperial interventions, if we can put it that way, um, as opposed to the old school realist interventions, the, the, the George W. Bush invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq, but the dirty wars that have been fought against Libya, against Syria, against Yemen, the ethnic cleansing of Palestine, all of these sorts of things, uh, human rights are used as tools effectively to try and uh, put a good face on, to try and justify uh, horrific interventions. I'm pretty sure that by now this question has been asked a thousand times that why is it that a country um, takes it upon itself to talk about the human rights of other countries or even issue reports wh uh, when there are uh, already organizations that uh, are global and there, there is the UN body, there is, there is there's a lot of things, you know, for that report to come out. Why is it that one single country takes it upon itself to talk about this while it has a history, um, and right now it is practicing, you know, cases like George Floyd and outside its borders. You have cases like uh, Jamal Khashoggi at the Saudi consulate in Istanbul two years ago that it closes its eye on. Yes, well, the reason is it's part of this operation of the weaponization of human rights as a tool of intervention, as a tool of war. Effectively, the U.S. State Department uh, controls, for example, Amnesty International. You know, most of what Amnesty International does now against China, against Iran, is coming directly from the policy of the State Department. And there are many other organizations that have been either set up or bought out effectively by the uh, by the State Department, by Washington. So Washington is directing these sorts of things. And I think we should recognize that it's a peculiar talent of the US. Some people have said, well, this is hypocrisy, the way they talk about human rights. But I think it's worse than that, or more than that, because let's remember, this is a state, this is a republic, which from its inception 200 and something years ago was talking about all human beings, are, all men are created equal, uh, written by people who were slave owners till the day they died. So what I'm saying is the double speak from the leaders of the U.S. is really something quite extraordinary and something they've relied on for a very, very long time. And it's not surprising that they should be leading this charge of trying to, you know, co-op popular concepts and turn it to their advantage. But of course, the problem is uh, the glory days of the U.S. are on the slide. What they had in the mid 20th century is really um, heading downhill. And unfortunately, in those circumstances, they remain quite dangerous. Yeah. Uh, Tim, well, of course, you know, just bearing in mind that, you know, no country or no body is saint, you know, but uh, uh, but the thing is that what is it that countries like Syria can do um, with or without the history of human rights violations? You know, what is it that they can do in order to have a counterpart? Because it's it's it seems to me. Uh, and I'm pretty sure to all the viewers that, you know, what uh, reports like this that are issued by the U.S. will have a bigger say, let's just say, you know, um, in the world's politics than statements that come from, you know, a place like Syria's foreign ministry. What else is there to be done to basically give it a counterpunch? Look, the, the, the actual physical resistance is largely local these days, but because we talk about these things in a global context, I think it's very important, I think, to see Syria lifting its voice, because in some respects, I think that's been a weakness in Syria's history, that its voice in the world has been very limited. Um, but 
uh, at the UN, for example, where there are some genuine multilateral agencies, that is to say the agencies created by the General Assembly, rather than the Security Council, which of course is blocked by the NATO groups which have been responsible for most of the, the serious crimes of the 21st century, at the General Assembly level we do have some progressive things. We do have coalitions of countries, of course they're typically ignored by the United States, but coalitions of countries that come in on real issues and so so in that sense the coalition the real international community the real one not the not the warmongers the big powers the real inter international community does have influence in the world when it can mobilize organize and lift its voices and little countries like Syria I think it's very welcome to see them lifting their voice mm -hmm. thank you very much Tim Anderson director for Center for counter hegemonic studies out of Sydney appreciate it